All right, I'm recording. Cool. Uh, so I can start now? Yes. Okay. All right, well, uh, hello. Thank you for joining this workshop. My name is Vin Armani. I'm the CTO of Cointex.io. Today we're going to be talking about the swap protocol that Signal, Watch, and Pay. Uh, although it was described as a workshop, I, uh, I think that probably what I'm... Uh, what is the best thing for me to do with the time today? And when I say time, by the way, I'm here and I'm here in Saipan. It's early, early morning, so the sun will be coming up throughout this presentation. So it should be cool in the background to watch that happen. But um, I think the best thing to do, uh, and and what I'm going to do today, is to sort of lay out in in simple terms what swap is, because I think that there's some misunderstanding about sort of what swap is because it encom encompasses a lot of concepts but it solves one very important concept so it en encompasses a, a concept collaborative transactions that is being used a lot now by some of the the projects that people are the most excited about but it solves a particular problem and so let me just uh, share my screen and here we go All right, so the title of my presentation is Signal Watch and Pay Protocol Toward a Decentralized Economy. I don't know if I can go fully, let's see, I don't think I can go fully present. Let's see if I lose everything. No, I can. Okay, excellent. Perfect. So signal watch and pay protocol toward a decentralized economy. Are you guys getting that full screen? Can somebody just give me a high sign if you're getting it full screen, if it looks good? Yeah, okay, good. Okay, good. Excellent. Okay, it's okay. Excellent. So uh, before I start, if anybody wants to just, uh, just learn more or follow along while this is going on, here are the, the two URLs. Uh, the first is for the specification. The second is for a JavaScript module that works with uh, Node.js that will that has end-to-end -end examples that are on mainnet. So that's pretty useful if you want to go through the code. It's in the examples folder. So for all of the different applications that I'm talking about here, there's basically end-to-end -end code where the uh, the example script will simulate all of the parties involved, and you can go down through it. It's pretty well documented, and you can go down through that. Okay. So the first thing here. What is the swap protocol? This is where I think that there's been a lot of misunderstanding. This is in, I believe that this is a super important protocol because it does for more advanced transactions, and we'll get into what those are, what Bitcoin did for money. So really what we're talking about here is it's a communications protocol. That's the most important part. Like it's the, it, swap is the communications protocol for negotiating and executing collaborative transactions on Bitcoin Cash. So this is about peers being able to communicate with each other. It's less about the transactions. I think a lot of people have gotten caught up on the transactions because they're kind of interesting. Um, and there's other projects that are doing that. But the key here is really the communications protocol. But before we talk about the communications protocol, because the collaborative transactions are interesting, what is a collaborative transaction? This is a term that, that's been used, term that's been thrown around. What is it? Okay. Here's your standard transactions. This is at a very high level. I think that most people, even the non-technical, will be able to walk away from this because they'll, they'll get it. Here's your standard transaction. Alice pays Bob. Okay. There's three primary collaborative transactions that I find to be particularly interesting right now that I think have some cool business models behind them. And they're also being used by other projects. So this will even give you a better understanding. I, I hope at the end of this of what's going on in some of these other projects. So the first collaborative transaction that's pretty interesting and that has become very popular in Bitcoin cash is a crowdfund transaction. So we're looking at Alice and Bob in a single transaction work together so that they can pay Carol. So that's the crowdfunding. Then you've got a SLP BCH atomic swap. So in this case, Alice and Bob pay Bob and Alice. So Alice contributes SLP, Bob contributes BCH, 
Bob then receives the BCH from Alice and Alice receives the SLP from Bob. All of this takes place in one transaction. And then an escrow transaction. So this is Alice and Bob pay into some sort of an escrow address that they'll be able to receive the funds based on something in the future. This could be an Oracle that's got price, that's got something about an event. This could be a time lock. There's tons of different things that this could be. It's some sort of an escrow contract that has some arrangement within it. And in one transaction, they're both going to pay in and fund this. So let's talk about collaborative transactions in the wild. So crowdfunding is Alice and Bob pay Carol. The thing that everybody's been using lately and that uses this, this basic model is Flipstarter. And so Swap helps you to be able to do Flipstarter. Swap isn't Flipstarter, but it helps you to be able to do the same type of contract that Flipstarter helps you to be able to do. You have your SLP BCH atomic swap. This is basically an exchange on chain in a single transaction. Alice and Bob pay Bob and Alice. So what's using that in the wild? Well, the SLP postage protocol is basically that. You send some SLP up to the post office. And in exchange for that, the post office is going to collaborate inside your transaction by adding on some BCH. So you basically are buying some BCH with your SLP and, and then it's putting the, the BCH into the transaction collaborating with you. Sideshift AI is also using a version of this. So if you do BCH exchanges for any of the SLP tokens that they offer, SPICE, USDH, now uh, USDT, the Tether, they will actually do this. So you'll notice if you go and you do a Sideshift AI shift of BCH for one of those, it happens very, very quickly because they're, they're basically doing the, almost the equivalent. They're doing it, a li it's a little bit chained. They haven't fully done a collaborative, but they're using it like in a chain of transactions. So it's almost, almost as effective there. Um, and then escrow with the Oracle. So that's Alice and Bob pay an escrow contract. And uh, people are very excited about any hedge. This is what I've been working on the most in let's say the last year. Um, if you go to my uh, JavaScript module, Jeton lib, which is basically an extension of bitcore-lib-cash uh, uh, or bitcore-cash.lib, I always get those confused, um, but it's the Bitcore Bitcoin Cash libraries. You'll be able to use three different types of escrow contracts there. And there's some, there's some full examples also in that. Uh, the, the three are, three types of escrow contracts are escrow with a, um, Escrow with it like an oracle. There's escrow with a price oracle. So an event oracle, a price oracle. And then the latest one that I added was actually a, a covenant. Uh, so like a pro rata covenant where you could say, okay, this can be spent by anyone, but it has to pay 50% to this address and 50% to this address. Um, so it's a, it's a cool way of doing things like fee addresses. If you wanted to set something up where there was a permanent fee address and no matter who paid that it would always go, let's say 30% to each of the partners and 10% in a business and 10% to, I don't know, some general fund that you guys are using. You could set something up like that only using one address and knowing for sure that it would be trustless. So that's, that's very good. It gives you the cool thing about collaborative transactions. One of the most important things, I mean, as you look at these applications, the most important thing, I think, is that it's trustless. In each of these cases, if somebody goes to, if somebody collaborates with you on a transaction and then they double spend the transaction, no harm, no foul. Basically, they can't take your money. So they're, them getting what they want, especially in the case of the SLP BCH atomic swap, them getting their money is dependent upon you getting your money. Can't get better than that. You can't get better incentives than that, that by screwing themselves, they'll screw you. So there's basically zero incentive to double spend. It gets them nothing in this case. So it's, it's quite good. Uh, it's quite good in that regard. Uh, the other thing that's interesting with the crowdfund and Flipstarter uses this is that, is that the nature of the BCH transaction where the total input amount has to be more than the total output amount, uh, it, that total output amount plus whatever minor fees are necessary. That automatically gives you 
the, um, the, uh, an assurance contract. That's basically the same thing as, um, uh, what am I, what the, all, all the crowd, all the various different uh, Kickstarter, right? To where it's like, if you don't have all of the funds and we're kind of seeing that on some of these, uh, on some of these flip starters that aren't getting the full amount of funds where people are like, oh no, we need to have an option that says, no, let, let it be if, even if it's not fully funded. Well, this, that's, that doesn't lend in the incentives. It's a good incentive structure to have this assurance contract. It's known, it's a known, uh, in economics, it's a known way to sort of mitigate the free rider uh, problem. So it's like, you donate, and if the, it's sort of a way of finding consensus that if the rest of everybody, or maybe you think it's a great idea, but you're only willing to put in 20 bucks, but it needs a thousand. And if the rest of the people around are like, man, that's not even worth a penny, then you actually get the, get the knowledge, the price knowledge of the market while still being able to participate up front. And then you are able to get your money back. So it's, it's a really cool mechanism. And it just so happens that the Bitcoin transaction structure allows us to do that like out of the box. So as you look at these things, like crowdfunding is something that can be done on, on, on all of the Bitcoin chains. It, this, this is something that that model of uh, everybody contribute is something that can be done on BTC too. Uh, the SLP BCH atomic swap, technically that can also be done on, on BSV. I just don't think anybody is using the SLP protocol on BSV at this point, but they certainly could. I think a lot of people haven't realized that like, it can, it can be used on any chain that has a sufficient uh, op return of a sufficient size, and BSV certainly does. So uh, I think there's probably a pretty good chance that somewhere down the line, somebody on BSV is smart enough to realize this. They're going to rename the token, of course. Uh, they're going to rename the protocol and just fork it off. But uh, they will probably have them as well, and they'll be able to do these atomic swaps once they, once they figure it out. Uh, but the escrow with the Oracle, because of OpCheck data sig, that can only be done on Bitcoin Cash at the moment. So uh, again, I think it's one of the reasons why that's the, the most interesting and futuristic and, and something that I think people should be um, focusing and spending their time on. Okay, so those transactions are possible, no problem, no problem. So now we get into what the swap solve. So it's not a matter of the transaction. But it's a matter of answering these two questions. And they're a problem of coordination. And at the end of the day, Bitcoin is a coordination engine. That's what it's for. That's what the entire idea of Nakamoto consensus is. It's about how can people who have no knowledge of one another coordinate in a trustless way of a global financial system. It's a big problem. Satoshi Nakamoto solved something that is like a philosophical problem. Very interesting. It's a, it's a big problem. So here's the problem of coordination. We've got, we know that we can make these transactions. We know that two people can participate in these transactions together. Or three, or four, or five, or a hundred in the case of like a flip starter. But you've got two questions. One, how do I know, sitting here in Saipan, that Chris Troutner over there, halfway on the other side of the world, wants to sell some uh, uh, permissionless software foundation tokens right now and is willing to accept Bitcoin Cash. How do I know that? If I don't know Chris, and I know Chris Troutner, he could probably reach out to me and say something, right? But let's say that I don't. Let's say it's my neighbor over here. How on earth would he know that? And then the second thing is, how, how can we collaborate in a trustless and censorship resistant manner. So even if I do have some access to some way that Chris and I can communicate and say, hey, let's make this trade. If we're going through a middleman who can censor that because he doesn't want us to make a trade or he doesn't want us to know that each other exists, well, the point of Bitcoin is kind of destroyed. So what we can do is we can use Bitcoin to answer these two questions. One, how can I know that anyone in the world wants to participate me, with me? And two, how can, when we're negotiating the contract, we communicate in a trustless and censorship resistant manner? So let's talk about how it's being handled now in the wild. 
and you'll get an idea of, I, I think while the solutions that are right now are good, why I have seen that there's a problem there, right? So let's take a look at Flipstarter. This is the first kind of collaborative transaction. This is our crowdfunding transaction. So what can you do? You, you want to start a flip starter. You want somebody to um, contribute to your flip starter, right? You need some funds. You want somebody to contribute. Here are your options, pretty much. It looks like to me. One, and this is what people are doing. You can announce your campaign on a social media platform. So you go on RBTC, you go on Twitter, you go into Telegram groups, and you say, here's my, here's my flip starter. Please contribute. Now, you can see how that's not really great at scale and how you're also potentially missing a whole lot of people because you're, you're limited by whoever's on the platform. So, for instance, I'm never on Discord. If you decide you're going to come on and promote on Discord, well, I, I'm not, I know nothing about it. I know nothing about that, right? Your other option is you can create a listing platform. So you could create, people have asked, well, where can I go to see all the flip starters? Right? Is there a, a, a place where they're all aggregated? Well, okay, that's fine. But what if I don't know those U that URL? What if, what if I'm just not aware of it? So you're relying upon these platforms. So again, we've got platforms. So postage protocol, right? This is a protocol that I developed. It suffers from the same problem. Now, it's not necessary. It, I think postage protocol is because of the nature of it, maybe it's okay, but you still run into the same problem of coordination, right? So what are you stuck with? Well, you wanna know where the, people asked this from the beginning. Well, how do I know where all the post offices are that are competing? Well, what if you want some competing post offices, right? So what have I been doing? Well, I hard code the post office API server information into the application, the URL or whatever. Maybe I put in a list, maybe I put in just one. That's fine, but it's still limited. Or what, I could create a post office listing platform, perhaps, and I could pull from a lot of different places, and then you could use maybe that API, but still, we're still in a case where there may be somebody here in Saipan who's got a better deal for you, who would love to do business with you, who would love to make that exchange, but you don't even know that they exist. And they don't know that you exist, and there's no protocol for the two of you to be able to talk to each other. And then the third one is any hedge. So this is when we're talking about a custodian, uh, a, a uh, Bob, Alice and Bob pay to an escrow contract with an Oracle. This is actually a really hard one because you have three parties. One of them has to be blind, should be, the Oracle should be blind to what's going on in these other contracts. We don't want to put that risk in there of them actually participating and sort of, you know, putting out the wrong signature. And, and screwing things up. So you need a level of trustlessness. So you need that blindness. It's a very difficult problem. Uh, this, is, this is something that even back in, the first time I had a conversation with the general protocols guys uh, as individuals was back in Australia where I told them I was working on this problem as well, which I have been primarily around like uh, sports wagering and prediction markets. And I, I realized this is a really hard problem. And so, you know, I, I had conversations early on with them about like, well, how are you guys handling this? Because I, at that point, couldn't figure out what to do. And they, you know, they so far, um, sort of the most viable solution, the one that makes the most sense is you go to an exchange. The exchange has all of the people there. They're able to coordinate and communicate with each other uh, in the, programmatically in the background and you do it on an exchange platform. So that's fine, but I think that we can understand that if you're using a custodial exchange, you're already in the censorship, uh, the non-censorship resistant model. If it's something I had to sign up for, they can cut my account off at any time. Once you're on the chain, you're pretty good. Um, but again, you're also limited by who's on the exchange, who's on the platform. You don't get to potentially leverage every single person that's on the Bitcoin Cash network. So, signal watch and pay protocol. The problem that it's solving here and what it does is one, it's totally decentralized. It's as decentralized as the Bitcoin Cash network because it's right, everything that happens is riding on Bitcoin Cash transactions. So, it, in the same way, it's censorship resistant. 
in order to turn off swap protocol, in order to censor somebody, you'd have to be able to censor a Bitcoin cash tra uh, transaction. So that in and of itself, if we believe that Bitcoin cash transactions for our money are censorship resistant, since these are all Bitcoin cash transactions through which the communication is happening, we get that censorship resistance. It's universally available. Anybody that, uh, anywhere that the Bitcoin cash network can reach, Swap protocol, every single person that's within reach of that can participate with every other person. And I think the most important part, it uses existing Bitcoin Cash infrastructure. So if you've got a wallet currently, uh, if you've got a wallet that can do SLP tokens at this point, because it's, it's reading op return and this uses op return, you can code into that wallet without adding in any, well, I mean, besides the signal watch and pay protocol, um, if you want to use the library that I've written, you could write that in and make it easier. But even if you didn't have that, you could write it in right now based on spec. So it's just another way of reading op return and another way of sending up transactions. That, this part was very, very important to me. Uh, it was important to me that, that we could do this with what we had on Bitcoin Cash. Uh, and then that would mean that they're necessarily, if this is valuable, will be much competition among people to write the various libraries in many different languages. Um, and it's, it's sort of open source out the box. If you've got the spec, you can build this thing. And it's really not all that difficult to build, um, to be honest, once you understand the spec. So let's talk about what's happening. Let's talk about what's happening. It's called signal, watch, and pay. Those are the three different things that you're gonna do within this. You're gonna signal, as a participant, you're gonna watch and you're gonna pay. So what's a signal? Well, a signal is Alice says, I wanna exchange my BCH for Spice. And it's a message that she's going to broadcast up onto Bitcoin Cash. Now this is very similar to some people who have used like memo.cash and the memo protocol that you're broadcasting a message up and anybody who can read the memo protocol, it's just a protocol. You broadcast it with the memo protocol. Anybody who can read it, it doesn't have to be on memo.cash. Anybody can pull it down. This is similar in that way, in that it's specially formatted. It has some tags to say what it is. It has the, the information to say how much BCH, BCH she wants to trade. As a matter of fact, she's actually trading, she's actually telling you what UTXO specifically she wants to trade. So she's saying, this UTXO right here, I want to exchange this for spice. I want to exchange it at this exchange rate. So she broadcasts that up to the Bitcoin Cash Network. Now it's there. Now anybody can see it if they're watching. So you've got Bob. Bob is watching the Bitcoin Cash blockchain. He's got Spice. He's watching for someone to say that. His wallet is watching. All of a sudden, boop, someone wants to make an exchange. Now you'll notice that this model starts to look like an exchange order book. So when we're talking about doing this exchange, what we've basically done is eliminated even the need when you're doing a BCH to SLP exchange for an exchange period. We have the capability to have a global order book. No exchanges. It's just right there in your wallet. You say, I want to, and it's saying, these are all the people willing to sell. It becomes this bazaar that you're able to walk into and see everybody selling their wares and competing at different prices. Right? That's what it looks like at, an, at, at its most evolved level. So Bob is watching. Bob's got some spice. Bob now sends a, a, another signal up, and he basically directs it right back at Alice. And he says, listen, this, this isn't what the signal says, but this is what it communicates. I want to exchange my spice for your BCH, and most importantly, I've already created the transaction. I've already created the whole transaction. It's just missing your signature. I've signed it, it's here, it's a valid transaction. Here's what it looks like. All it needs is your signature. And he broadcasts that back to the Bitcoin Cash Network. One of the things that you notice here is neither one of them knows where the other one is, who the other one is, high level of privacy here. High level of privacy. Alice is of course watching. She sent out the signal, signal and watch. She sent out the signal, now she's watching to see if anybody responds to her signal. Bob has responded to her signal. So she gets this half-signed transaction. She takes a look, look at it. 
says, okay, that's good. She signs her part. Now it's a valid transaction. And she broadcasts the fully signed transaction up onto the Bitcoin Cash Network, and we're done. And we're done. Alice has gotten her, her, um, her spice, or back for her BCH. Bob, I know, I'm getting a little confused here. Bob has received BCH in exchange for his spice. They've done it all in one transaction, and done. Trustless, decentralized, globally available, and using all of the existing infrastructure that's already in your wallets right now. So I often uh, say, what's the canonical application? I know I probably bug Chris Troutner with this all the time. What's the canonical application? Well, what does canonical application mean? Canonical application is like, well, what is, it's not even the killer app. It's like, what is the thing that this will be most used for? So for instance, you can use a car for a lot of things. Right. You can you can like fill a car with all kinds of speakers and then you can take it out and it can be a sound system if you want. It could be a generator. If you're if you run out of power, you know, you could turn it on and it could be a generator of electricity. But what's the canonical application of a car? Well, it, it's a mode of transportation to get you from point A to point B. That's it. Right. That's the canonical application. So what are the canonical applications now that now that you see sort of how this communication works? extrapolate it out into this universally available, decentralized situation. What are the canonical applications of these, of just these three? And that's to say this can be expanded out because it's just communication, so it can easily be expanded out and the spec allows for expansion. And as we get other capabilities, of course there will be more. So with the crowdfunding, what are we talking about? What are, what are we talking about disrupting here? What industries? Equity investment, right? So. While you can do things like flip starter, you could also do things that are more like securities. So that we're more like, I want to fund an actual business. And in exchange for that funding, for instance, you'll get, let's say you get SLP tokens, right? And those act sort of like shares that, that you could pay back out to. I do believe that this is gonna happen. I also uh, have sat down and worked with a few people after after I release Swap, and hopefully in the next year I can I can write more about this. But um, it does look like there may be a way to do this such that it is actually exempt from like SEC security regulations if it's done correctly. And I think that that could be highly disruptive. Um, of course, assurance contracts that's already being done with Flipstarter. But you could have a situation using if you took Flipstarter plus the Swap protocol and just added it in as a protocol into a wallet, you could have a situation where your wallet could actually be dinging you if there were new Flipstarter campaigns that were coming in. And then taking you to let's, let's say an IPFS link that had information about what was going on with that, that you could look into and then you could just fund it. You wouldn't need to be, you know, you could just turn your notifications on in your wallet and it could ding you. Uh, and it would do it all through the uh, Bitcoin Cash blockchain. Uh, SLP BCH atomic swap. Okay, well, what are we talking about here in terms of canonical applications? Truly decentralized exchanges. And I mean truly, like we're talking peer to peer, where it's just like me, you, and the Bitcoin Cash blockchain. Nothing in between. No one in between. Peg stable coins. This is something that's actually uh, that I haven't talked a lot about. I think that this is incredibly powerful. Uh, this is actually written into the spec as a piece of it, expecting that this would be there. But if you have a situation where I can see your holdings and you can cryptographically prove to me your holdings and the UTXOs that you're going to use to exchange with me, you actually have a situation where you can do a peg. So you could, this is how like the central banks do pegging, like the Bank of China pegs to the US dollar. It's based on reserves. So this would be the first time that we could have truly decentralized peg stable coins. So for instance, you could peg to uh, BCH to where you, to, to where depending upon the price of BCH, one of these tokens would always return you back $1 worth of BCH. So that's something that could be done all on chain. Very, very interesting. The ability to give ourselves a stable coin that was based completely on, on BCH. Um, and then escrow with an Oracle. I mean, these are, these are pretty obvious. These are pretty straightforward. Prediction markets of all different kinds. Um, sports wagering, that's a type of a prediction market. That's a, I mean, 
it's a hundred fifty billion dollar a year global business right there, right? So this is possible to disrupt that. It's it also turns out when you do this with sports wagering that it's regulatorily exempt, especially in the U.S., which is important. Uh, and futures, you know, uh, futures. This is something that any hedge is doing, but it could be done with any sorts of, of futures markets because those are just those are prediction markets. Um, so, again, uh, if you want to learn more, these are the URLs. Uh, I'm going to do some island hopping a little later on today, so I can do about like people have questions. I can do like about 15 minutes, I think, of uh, of questions. I'm looking in. Discord as well. I don't. I don't know which one of these places there's uh, questions, but uh, if anybody has questions, that's it for me. Yeah, I got a question, Vin. Um, so your the implementation right now for the the watch part. Um, I think we've talked that it's BitDB, but I I like this. I like the idea of that it's more of a memo thing, and maybe the wallet can do it. On its own, can you expand on the options there? Like, is BitDB the only like practical way of doing this that you found so far? Are there other implementations that you've been thinking of? Well, right now, BitDB is sort of the best because of the indexing. So this does re this does require um, that to do this well. It requires the type of indexing that BitDB does, which uh, allows you to search for um, pieces of the op return. It does that really in interestingly. So it allows you to really separate out data within an op return and then BitDB indexes all of it. So that so in this way, you can kind of search and that's the way that the op return in the, the protocol is laid out. You can do a search, for instance, that says, show me, show me all of the uh, available offers to participate in an escrow contract that's using this particular oracle. And that, it, and that it's taking this particular side of the bet, right? So you're like, I wanna, I wanna take the, the long position. He's taking the short position in a futures contract. I wanna take the long and I want from this particular Oracle. And then it can show you all of those that have been done. So it does require a, a, a level of indexing. I'm hoping, I mean, it, it's, BitDB is available, but I think that with the work that it seems has been started with um, James Kramer and JT Freeman on the BCHD node with the SLP indexing. It seems like the next logical step with that would be more advanced and at least an option for more advanced op return indexing. And then in that case, you could just directly point at, um, at a BCHD node, but, but I, you know, capability wise, if you wanted to devote the resources on your own device or on your own application, um, this certainly could be done um, in an SPV wallet, right? So as the SPV wallet is seeing, you know, uh, transactions come in, it can be looking for those. Um, that's a, that, is, that is certainly a capability. It's something that could happen. I think, you know, it's probably for the moment we're going to be calling out to infrastructure with the wallets as we are in, in the case with most SLP tokens. But certainly down the line, there's nothing to say that you couldn't uh, that you couldn't take this in, you know, and then parse it as it as it was coming in. And then even, you know, the cool thing about it is that you can tell because of the way that the protocol works, you can tell which signals are, let's say, have already been paid which signals are, 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 are no longer available and whatnot. So you could literally like prune those out of your database. They're just not important anymore. So it does give you some opportunity for garbage collection in that way. Um, I, it, it, that's, that's the future. And, and I hope that as this is more valuable that people will, will be inspired to find new ways to, to do this. I'd love to see it happen all within a, within a single wallet. I just, at this point, we're not quite there, but it's, it's totally possible. Yeah, just a food for thought. I was actually just talking to JT about this yesterday, and he had the idea of um, if you could add web hooks to a full node like BCHD, so that when it encounters an op return that has like a specific locat ID, it can fire a, a web hook, and, uh, and and you could just load that in at the when you start the node with like a CSV file. So that was kind of the idea we were kicking around. I think it would fit well with this. Well, I mean, if you can get the it, so if you're 
the, in, the cool part about this is that you don't really need any more information in this except what's in the op return. So very different than like an SLP token, there is no external uh, information needed. All the information that you need to do what it is that you're gonna do is included within um, the op return. The, the, the sort of ex exception to this might be if you, um, for, for the crowdfunding, if you wanted to put some additional, there's a, a, a field for an additional like a, a URI in there if you wanted information about the crowdfund. But in the case of the contract and in the case of the, um, so the, the escrow contract with an Oracle and the case of the uh, exchange, the atomic swap, everything you need is within the, the op return or within another op return. So an Oracle op return that you would need to call out for. So, so, so yeah, I mean, I, I think that like the idea of a webhook is interesting, but it's in this case, it adds a, it adds another layer. This is a very, very simplified and, um, and I would say efficient protocol in terms of making those communications. So, uh, Van, hey. Hey. Uh, <clears throat> I, uh, I'm, I've got a kind of complex problem here and I, I'm uh, looking like this is probably the answer. I, I just have a couple questions about it, right? Sure, go ahead. So, okay, so first thing is uh, Cyfrog plan is to be an algo stable coin. Um, yeah, SLP, right? But I'm looking to have the algorithmic stable token to build something on top of, um, which is I want the ultimate goal is what I want is a marketplace like Amazon where you can go and you can post a transaction for some you know, service or or goods that are not tokens, right? Um, and to build that network, I want to be able to send an SLP, have someone else receive the SLP they want to receive, right? So let's say someone is spending spice, but they're spending spice in Honkistan, where people only accept honk um, to do that swap. So I have a few questions related to that. Um, and uh, one is, so can you do the escrow in an SLP token, right? Because this requires an escrow, because uh, the marketplace is generally run on, on an escrow, right? So someone pays, someone pays the spice, the spice gets swapped in honk, but also that spice or that honk doesn't arrive until there's been a, a confirmed shipment or release. If it's, a, if it's like a paywall, if what they're selling is not physical goods, right? That might be some access to web content or something like that, um, that there's been, there's some hash associated with whatever it is, you know, something's been unlocked. The system has determined to release the money because the, because the services or goods have been delivered. Um, so that's question one. Can you, can, can the, is the escrow in SLP or is it just in BCH? So when we're talking about escrow, what we're talking about is technically we're talking about an ad, it's just an address. Um, all of every script contract. So if we're talking about an escrow contract, we're talking about an address. So that address, uh, that locking script can be, uh, yeah, it can, it's, it's, it's really independent of SLP. What identifies it as being an SLP is the output before it. So yeah, you can, you can send an SLP token to any BCH address and these are just BCH addresses. Um, uh, so, so that's fine. But I think what I'm hearing, so I, I, it's, it sounds like what I'm hearing uh, from you is, is also a, an interest in converting one token to another in kind of a trustless way. At the moment, uh, because you can only have one uh, token per transaction, so one token type per transaction, because you can only have one op return uh, in a given transaction, I know that there's some moves by some people to, to change that. I'm ambivalent about whether that's a good idea, but at the moment you can only have one. So uh, there's no way to use swap in the fully trustless manner uh, that's being described to swap from let's say spice to honk. Um, you could set up, in the middle of that, you could set up uh, your own kind of exchange and sort of help this along. 
you know, if you had your application and your platform, and you could certainly use Swap to do that, but um, it's probably faster to just do with this, with kind of a centralized uh, exchange. Uh, the only, the only difference. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. What were you gonna say? Go ahead. Okay, so you could do, um, but you could do like Spice to BCH and then mm -hmm. uh, BCH to Hong. Yes. Yes. So wouldn't, yes. Be, wouldn't be stuck on the one way like the with memo.cash Cor correct correct but you would still be you still have to look at it as uh perhaps not being as efficient as you might want it to be for your particular application um, because you would still be unless you were going to be the counterparty in both cases uh, you would still be sort of waiting on the marketplace to uh to fulfill the, the the signal you still got to look at it as kind of like you're in an order book right but if you were willing to to play both sides of that uh, the, as the counterparty and to hold BCH and Honk and Spice and sort of leave an open window, which is something that is kind of that reserve, um, that reserve model, then yeah, you'd be able to fill, fulfill everybody's orders, but you'd be able to do it in a non-custodial way, which is really cool. So it's like that will actually get you out of a lot of regulatory trouble. Um, because you're not holding on to somebody else's funds, that you're just completing these trades on your own, right? And you could even complete the trades for a profit, which is which is cool. So so that's a way that Swap could help you if you wanted to do it that way. Um, but for maximum efficiency, it would be you know to just have a centralized custodial exchange, something like um, SideShift.ai to to do that. So I'm not. I'm not necessarily uh, uh, pressing ahead with a, with, a, with a pressing need to have this thing built. So I'm trying to build it the right way. And part of it is, yeah, can I do it? And, you know, then the end result is all going to be open source. I'll just post it, right? So it's um, uh, on the, um, I could also enable it for to be basically market maker friendly then, right? So instead of just sitting there with a ton of BCH and Honkin Spice, I could have a system where anyone could come in and be that market maker. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, yeah. 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 Let me, uh, let me, uh, thanks for that. Let me get to, cause I, I have a limited amount of time. I'm going island yeah, yeah. hopping in a little while. So th thank you. Thank you for that question. Right, I see, I see Orion is asking curious if Vin has considered using a network outside of BCH for signaling, much like the way stamp works. I worry about the number of opportun transactions unnecessarily clogging the network. Uh, it's a good concern. I think that, you know, in this case, um, these are, this is solving a particular problem. You can, I, I, and again, I, and I think that this is something that has been confusing people. You know, they say using a network outside of BCH for signaling. So I think like, the signal is the transaction onto the BCH network, right? It is not the offer of, hey, let's do a, a collaborative transaction. You could, you could build a wallet that could do that in any way. You could do that in person with QR codes. You're just passing data. You could do it with NFC. You could do it over via stamp. You could do it, you could literally do these as telegram messages if you wanted to, to one another right? And copy and paste them into your application. You totally could do that as hexes and it would work. It would work. Um, the, the, the idea of the signal in the first place and what you're getting from out of BCH and, and using the op return transactions and why they're necessary is you are getting the censorship resistance, the decentralization and the global availability. Those are the three things. And, and you can't get that unless you're using the platform that you know everybody is on. So if you've got BCH, if you've got SLP tokens, I know you're on the BCH network, <laughs> like done. So this is a case where you're able to already reach everybody who is on the network. You could of course use other networks and other platforms, but you're going to be limited in scope to the number of people that are on that network. So not everybody on stamp, not everybody on the BCH network is on stamp. That doesn't mean that you couldn't do this on stamp. Um, I'm also somebody who's, who's very much not for, uh, who, who's for using payment channels when you can. So like the, I'm working on a project right now that's actually using a covenant based 
payment channel, which is interesting. It's something that you can't do on BTC and it actually works very, very well. It's very efficient. And the idea is to not put everything on chain. Um, you know, to be able to do something like Satoshi Dice and there's only, you know, the, the one where you go into escrow and the one where you come out. Um, so other question, uh, how would you ex execute an escrow transaction that requires a moderator similar to local.bitcoin.com but completely on chain? Um, so the, the whole idea of the moderator, if you, if you do a moderator, you, you could do that not on chain. I mean, it's, but the moderator cannot be blind to the transaction. That's the thing. So you could still do it completely on chain. You could do local.bitcoin.com using swap, as a matter of fact. Uh, you could do the whole thing using swap. Uh, you just use the, an on-chain Oracle as uh, basically as the, as the moderator. But if you wanted it to do something special, um, you would have to, there would have to be another level of communication. So like, if you're like, oh, please refund me my money, you know, there would have to be another level of communication. This is not really for that. Uh, the idea, the idea in this case, you know, I mean, local.bitcoin.com, while you're in custody of your funds, uh, there, it's not fully trustless because there is a third party that potentially could override and send your funds somewhere that, that it isn't. I mean, you are trusting Bitcoin.com in that case. And I think that that's perfectly fine. I mean, for what you get, it's fine. I'm not completely against trusted third parties. Um, but, you know, for the applications that we're talking about, for instance, like for futures, you know, you pick an Oracle, you pick an Oracle that's got a, a known history and you can see it, it's an on-chain Oracle. Uh, if, if you want to look up, I've got the JSON Oracle standard. Uh, if you just search my name in JSON Oracle standard, that's out there as well. Uh, and you'll see that standard being used in the examples. So uh, uh, in, my, in my library. And that's for an on-chain Oracle. And you, that way you could do things like futures. Um, and the Oracle is blind. That's part of what, what helps to make it trustless is that the Oracle is blind. But you can also choose between Oracles. So you have a market for Oracles. Uh, and you're able to see whether oracles have gotten it right over time. That's one of the important things about something being on chain in an immutable record is that you can see it before choosing an oracle and you can actually have third parties that can audit and say, well, how often was this oracle wrong? Has this oracle been wrong in the last three years? Has it screwed up? Uh, and if the answer is no, and they're putting out, you know, a hundred different uh, oracle signals every day, and they've never gotten it wrong, you're like, okay, well, I think I can trust it for this, for this futures contract that I'm gonna to put together. Um, or your next door neighbor could be the Oracle. So it adds this decentralized layer and that's what you're, um, and that's what you're, that's what you're handling. So I'll take this last one that says, it seems like the number of opportune transactions needed to replicate the order book of say Coinbase is orders of magnitude larger than what BCH is currently capable of. Yeah, uh, that's probably true. And that's a champagne problem. So if you reach the, the point where you had so much exchange volume happening on the BCH network that uh, it reached the level of Coinbase, the BCH network is something completely different. If you reach that level uh, to where you are going and where blocks are full, BCH is the, is the number one cryptocurrency in the world. It's the most useful. Uh, it's got the most, the, the most users. It's got the most volume by far. So... That's a champagne problem. I, I, doubt that, I doubt that we will get to that point. Um, I think that by the time we're approaching that, there will be enough, uh, enough of a, a profit motive and enough incentive for people to find solutions that do things like payment channels and get paid a, a pretty penny to do so, uh, just because they're faster, if, if for nothing else. Uh, but they're also, they're also more efficient. So, so yeah, that's a champagne problem. Let's see that happen. It's not weather data. It's not cat videos. It's act, those would be actual economic activity happening, especially between SLP tokens, uh, futures contracts, prediction markets. Yeah, if we fill up the blockchain with legitimate transactions like that, champagne problem, BCH to the moon. It's the greatest thing that's ever happened. We've overtaken BTC and Ethereum. So yeah, I'm there. I'm there. I'm ready for that. Uh, so with that, guys, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take off. I see my family packing up. Like I said, we're going to go island hopping around Saipan. Thanks for jo uh, joining me this morning. Uh, have a great rest of the DevCon, guys, and thanks for the invite. Thank you so much, Ben. Bye, guys. Okay.